got ourselves settled there. Uh, before we break into cardiac output, uh, if you had a chance to look over the key for that worksheet we did in class, do you have any questions from that before we move forward? If you haven't made it all the way through, we can also talk about it tomorrow, next week. We've got, we've got plenty of time, but we are going to be thinking about these things as we move into our next topic. I really find the cardiac cycle sucks to be that. Oh, most difficult hard topic because of all the things you have to tie together. Feeling well, okay so far? Awesome. Nice to hear it. Okay. So today we're talking about cardiac output. And all that really means is that we're thinking about how we get the full amount of blood out to the body. So when we talk about cardiac output, instead of talking about a single heartbeat, we're going to be talking about heart rate and the amount of blood circulating in our body every minute. Okay. As we talk about this, we are going to be recalling back to our last unit. We're going to be thinking about the nervous system again. I remember when we were talking about the nervous system, I tried to use heart rate as our example of what we were doing. So hopefully this doesn't come as a huge surprise to anyone. But now we're going to dive in a little bit to those details. Great, yeah, so we're thinking about parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous activity when we are thinking about controlling the heart rate. Not somatic with muscle, but just our skeletal muscle. All right. So the thing, main thing we're gonna remember when we talk about cardiac output is this equation, which is cardiac output equals stroke volume by heart rate. So I do want you to remember that because we're gonna think about cardiac output more in ANT2 as we think about the rest of the cardiovascular system. It's helpful to just learn it now. But if you forget, right, you can kind of work backwards to find this equation, right? Because all we're really saying here, cardiac output is going to be the amount of the blood going out to your body per minute. When we think about how you would calculate that, it's just how much blood is your heart pumping every heartbeat? times the number of heartbeats, right? That's all we're trying to figure out, how much blood is coming out. Okay. So that's what these things stand for. The CO is our cardiac output. The SV is our stroke volume, so that's how much blood is pumping out. And then the heart rate, just our heart rate, like our pulse, right? So on average, our average cardiac output at rest is approximately five liters per minute. But we're gonna see a lot of variation in this cardiac output depending on different factors. For one thing, we're not always at rest, right? So this is dependent on the heart being at rest. The average blood volume uh, in your body is 5.5 liters. So this means you're circulating through almost all of that blood in a minute. So we're not, going to see equations quite this detailed in the future, but I find it helpful to go through at least one example to demonstrate how we might use this. Okay, so take a second to, to read this question and we'll do this calculation out together in a minute. And it is calling back to previous understanding of end diastolic and end systolic volume. Okay. 
Okay, so let's start uh, with the stroke volume. So we're trying to find cardiac output. And what we have in this question is information that's going to tell us the heart rate as well as the stroke volume. So you can see that they haven't told us stroke volume directly, but we can use two of these pieces of information to find the stroke volume. So which two things are we going to be looking at to find the stroke volume? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how are we going to set that up in our equation? We're going to add them, subtract them, divide them. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to do EDV minus ESV, right? So looking at those numbers. We might even be able to guess that, right? Because that's the only thing that really gives us a number that makes sense. All right, so 160 minus one minus 30 gives us 130. So that's our stroke volume. All right. So cardiac output equals stroke volume times heart rate. Okay. So here we have our interval between resting points is 0.6 seconds. So anybody get a number there for a heart rate? What would our heart rate be if we have 0.6 seconds between our heartbeats? Ish, I, like 100 ish, yeah. Uh, I think you're you're calculating in the time it takes for the heart to beat, right? Um, but yeah, so it's going to be approximately 100, a little a little lower because of the amount of time it takes the heart to beat. So we get 13,000 milliliters, which is 13 liters. So that's how we would tie all these different things together that we might measure. Mm -hmm. It is. So what do you think might be happening in this situation? How do we have this crazy 13 liters? Yeah, right. exercising or somehow in this heightened state, right? So what part of the nervous system might we expect to be more active during, during this situation? Yeah, exactly. So this is something that might happen under sympathetic nervous control. We might even recognize also that 100, we've seen that number as it relates to the heart before. Does anybody remember what that is? So you might, you might call it something like that as because it's faster, but this is actually the natural pace of that sinus atrial node that we're looking at in the conductive system. So it's not our normal heart rate, but if we didn't have any input to the heart at all, that's where we'd find ourselves falling. There are factors that affect the cardiac output, just these two things, heart rate and stroke volume, in terms of like the physics of it. But we are going to see that there are a lot of things that affect either heart rate, stroke volume, or both. So we're always trying to get down to those two factors when we figure out whether things increase or decrease cardiac output. But we do need to know more details about which affects each of those impacts. So we sometimes break down our understanding of things that affect heart rate and stroke volume by talking about extrinsic uh, regulation, and we separate that from intrinsic regulation. So basically, if we're talking about something outside of the heart affecting the heart, that's extrinsic, right? X means outside of something like that. So that's going to be our nervous control, so neural control and hormones, so hormones we talked about coming from our endocrine system. We're gonna see that both of those will affect the heart. Intrinsic effects on heart rate and stroke volume are gonna be things within the heart itself. So things like pressures in the heart, things like stretch in the muscles, things like that. So any auto-regulation of the heart would be intrinsic regulation. So here we see a map of nerves going to the heart. 
So since we're here, I want to review a little bit about the nerves. So it tells us here that this blue line is the vagus nerve, which is how we're getting parasympathetic innervation to the heart. Uh, if it didn't tell us those two things, how might we be able to tell that this is a parasympathetic nerve? Mm -hmm. Yes, in the medulla, which is part of the brainstem. So it's from that craniosacral region, right? So that's where we have parasympathetic innervation coming. Great. So how could we tell that these green lines are sympathetic nerves then? Mm -hmm. Yep, it's thoracolumbar uh, innervation. And we can see that sympathetic chain there, which is our most common route for uh, synapsing these sympathetic nerves. So while we're looking at this, I want you to carefully take a look at the relative distribution of our parasympathetic nerves and the sympathetic nerves. So what do you see that's different between these two, between the blue lines and the green lines and where they're going? Maybe let's focus on what part of the heart might we be focusing on here when we're trying to spot the difference. They're, they're both going to be extrinsic, but what I want you to see here, right, look at this bottom green line, right? So this bottom green line is showing us that sympathetic nerves go to the ventricle. So it says it's going to the ventricular myocardium, so the heart muscle in the ventricle. Do you see any parasympathetics going to the ventricle? No, they're not going there. So this immediately should tell us that we're going to see a little bit of difference between parasympathetics and sympathetics, not just in whether they're sort of speeding up or slowing down, but also which parts of the heart they're affecting. So when we're thinking about the atria, we can see that we have both uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic innervation to those nodes, the SA node and the AD node. So we'll expect that that pace of the heart, so the heart rate is going to be set by both of these kind of in combination. But when we're looking at the ventricles, we see we only have sympathetics. So you can see that the sympathetics are going to do an additional sort of type or part of regulation, which we do have a slide on, but it's basically that the sympathetics are also controlling how hard the heart squeezes. So they'll also be controlling ventricular contractility. But because the parasympathetic nerves don't get down to the ventricles, they can't do that. So when we're thinking about the heart rate, that SA node, that's our fastest node, right? That's our fastest part of this conductive system. So uh, we're going to expect the SA node under normal conditions to be the one setting our heart rate, setting that pace. An intrinsic firing rate, because it has those pacemaker cells, right, that depolarize, and it's kind of on cue in this sort of wave pattern, right? Intrinsic firing rate is 100 beats per minute, which now is faster than it should be if you take your pulse right now, right? Who knows? Your mileage may vary, right? But it's probably not sitting here having your heart fire at 100 beats per minute. So, um, yeah. so that means that right now, you are hopefully, depending on how stressed out you are today, hopefully you are at rest right now. So at rest, our parasympathetic nervous system dominates. So you're sitting, my heart rate is probably a little higher than yours because I'm standing, walking around. Um, so you should be somewhere a bit lower than 100, right? So this means that our parasympathetic system is pulling the intrinsic firing rate of that SA node down right now. And another quick just review thing while we're looking at this slide. So this slide says that the firing rate of the SA node is under the control of ANS and hormones. Anybody want to tell me what ANS means here? So 
So what do we call these two things together? Yeah, this is our autonomic nervous system. So. Autonomic nervous system. at rest under normal conditions your heart rate is lower than the intrinsic firing rate because your parasympathetic nervous system is in control but in situations of stress excitement your sympathetic nervous system takes over your heart rate increases can increase to 100 can increase past 100. so when we're thinking about heart rate we always want to keep in mind that concept of dual innervation there. So heart rate is under dual control of the parasympathetic and sympathetic. So we always have both active, but we're talking about how we're shifting between the two. Right? It's not a total on off switch, right? You don't only have like three choices for heart rate. We have this sliding scale controlled by how much the parasympathetic system is innervating versus how much the sympathetic nervous system is. So a way that we could have control here, we're thinking about increased sympathetic activity. So here we're thinking sympathetic activity is gonna be releasing uh, nervous control or epinephrine. So what's our other hormone that we associate with the sympathetic activity or sorry, neurotransmitter, I should say. Mm -hmm, right, norepinephrine. norepinephrine. So both of these are possible uh, things we could have going, coming into the heart. And then we see one of our old friends, our beta-1 receptors. Uh, so who remembers what type of receptor a beta-1 receptor would be? I had a name for this like class of receptors, beta-1, 2, and 3, and alpha-1. Yeah, exactly. So this is an adrenergic receptor. That's an A. Adrenergic. Beta receptors specifically mean that we're going to be activating the cyclic A and P creation, which isn't here on that map. But what it would ultimately do is increase the open state of our sodium and calcium channels. And sodium and calcium depolarize the heart. So it's going to be increasing the rate of depolarization. So we're gonna have this sort of combination between the pacemaker cells, right? They have their natural rate of depolarization, but by opening more sodium and calcium channels, um, we make it go faster uh, because we've made it easier to depolarize. And this is how we have the effect of increasing our heart rate. So we can see a map of how this would happen here. Right, so now we're looking at our phospholipid bilayer, right, that membrane. Here we see one of our embedded proteins, right? This is an integral protein. It's a transmembrane protein. We were studying for finals while we talk. Uh, it is also an adrenergic receptor, the beta-1 receptor that has roughly equivalent affinity for norepinephrine and epinephrine got this G protein associated with it. That G protein activates another membrane protein that is an enzyme that jump starts the cyclic A and P system. The second messenger system gets activated. And ultimately that's what has the effects on our channels in the membrane, letting more sodium and calcium in which depolarizes our cells. Right. So this would all be happening in at the SA node as we send those uh, sympathetic nerve action potentials to the heart. In the opposite 
direction. So we're at rest. We have parasympathetic control. We're going to have parasympathetic action potentials coming into that SA node. They're specifically going to be coming in on the vagus nerve, which is one of our cranial nerves. And now, instead of reaching an adrenergic receptor, they're coming into a muscarinic cholinergic receptor. So what neurotransmitter does that mean we're talking about here? What's at the end of our parasympathetic? Yeah, exactly. We have our acetylcholine. Activating that muscarinic cholinergic receptor, which is the one that's a little slower, but allows us more variation in response. So here, our response in the heart to that acetylcholine binding to the muscarinic cholinergic receptor is to open potassium channels and close calcium channels. The potassium was trying to escape. Now it can't, and we can't uh, get any more calcium in. So this is going to decrease our rate of depolarization, hyperpolarizes the cell, decreasing the heart rate. So basically it's making it harder to depolarize. So it takes longer to depolarize, which is why we have a lower heart rate. Does that roughly make sense for these two opposing systems? So we can see what that receptor looks like and how it would work. Right, so here we see our muscarinic cholinergic receptor. Acetylcholine is coming in. We have a G protein here associated with muscarinic cholinergic receptors as well. And we have our two effects, closing those calcium channels, opening those potassium channels. So if we were to map then our uh, membrane potentials over time, we're going to trace first uh, what we would be at rest. So at rest, we're just thinking kind of normal conditions. We have a curve that looks like this, approximately. Right. So there's our heart rate. So we can see here we have two action potentials, two depolarizations, one and two, 0.8 seconds apart. If we activate the sympathetic nervous system, right? So we have a bunch of norepinephrine, for example, coming in to those beta-1 receptors. We can see that we've pushed those depolarizations a little closer together. So now we have one, two, three of them. That fit on this chart. Or if we really activate the parasympathetic, sorry, so slow them down even from the resting point, maybe you're asleep now, we can see that we only had one depolarization in the same time period. So all we're doing is kind of shifting how close together uh, these depolarizations, these action potentials are. We also have hormonal control of the heart rate, which works pretty similarly. So hormonal control of the heart rate is mostly epinephrine. So someone remind me where epinephrine is coming from? What gland? Yeah, exactly. Epinephrine is coming from your adrenal gland. Um, it's practically part of your sympathetic nervous system, right? So it's going to act the same as the rest of the sympathetic nervous system. It's just a very slightly different hormone here instead of a neurotransmitter directly from a nerve. So epinephrine acts the same on those beta-1 receptors because the beta-1 receptors accept both. They have affinity for both norepinephrine and epinephrine. So it doesn't really matter who the beta-1 receptor, whether it got that hormone from circulating blood or whether it got it from a nerve going directly there. So the epinephrine would have the same effect as the sympathetic nervous system does generally. 
would increase the action potential at that SA node, speeding up our heart. And a formal way of saying we're speeding up the heart rate, right, is increasing the velocity of action potential conduction in the muscle fibers. Now, other hormones we talked about do have effects on the heart as well. They're a little more poorly understood exactly how they function kind of on a day to day level. But one thing we do know is that glucagon increases the heart rate. Most of our other hormones that we talked about have, have more effects kind of on contractility, um, but at least glucagon can affect heart rate. Oh, that's a great idea. I have, I don't know. <laughs> I think it was about the glucose, but yeah. yeah. That'd be a good thing to look up. Okay. Um, so integrating our changes in heart rate it really just means that we're thinking about all of the different factors that could affect the heart rate at once. So we want to think about how much sympathetic activity there is. Right? So that would tend to increase the heart rate. We also want to think about how much parasympathetic activity there is. I would tend to lower the heart rate. And then circulating levels of hormones, really mainly epinephrine, would raise the heart rate as well. So we're not going to mathematically add together all these things, but that's that's kind of what your body is adding together to figure out where we're going to set the heart rate. Everyone remember this equation, right? cardiac output, stroke volume by heart rate. So what we've been talking about just now right, is the heart rate part. So next we're going to think about the stroke volume part. So when we're thinking about stroke volume, we're thinking about how much blood we squeeze out every heartbeat. So we're going to think largely about ventricular contractility as affecting the stroke volume. So that's how hard the heart muscle is squeezing, right? How much blood it is physically able to squeeze out is our stroke volume. But we're going to have two other factors that also play a role here. So we're going to think about end diastolic volume. We're going to think about a thing called afterload. So Conceptually, does anybody have any ideas why end diastolic volume might have an effect here? I'll tell you eventually. But end diastolic volume, right, is how much blood is getting to the heart. So if you imagine a heart that has more and more blood coming to it, but you still just keep squeezing out the same amount as when you have less blood, you're gonna get a heart that's kind of over full, right? So that's why we have to conceptually have a response to the end diastolic volume. And we'll see that this also actually has an effect on the physical state of like the sarcomeres in the muscle. But from a conceptual level, if we didn't have an effect here, we'd, we'd have changes to the physical shape of the heart because of the volume it would have to contain. So that would be a problem there. We haven't talked about this, this concept of afterload before, but basically afterload is going to be the pressure that the heart is pushing against. Um, so what artery do you think we might be kind of want to, in our minds, word associate with afterload? What, what artery might, might we be thinking about here? What, what are we pushing against when we're thinking about the heart? Yeah. So it's pressure in the rest of the system. So when we're thinking about the heartbeat pushing out, we know that left ventricle in order to eject blood has to have greater pressure than the pressure in the aorta. So that's why afterload, this pressure in the cardiovascular system makes a difference to the stroke volume. Because if we have high blood pressure right out in the cardiovascular system, that means there's high pressure in the aorta meaning we have to have higher pressure in the ventricle to open up that aortic valve, that semilunar valve, 
Um, so this affects the stroke volume because if we're not opening that valve, we're not getting blood out of the heart. And that's going to affect how much blood gets out of the heart in one heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Contractility, the most obvious one, is just that a more forceful contraction, so a muscle squeezing harder, is going to expel more blood. Right? This is under sympathetic control. So calling back to, to the beginning, so why is it under sympathetic but not parasympathetic control here? Yes, only those sympathetic nerves go to the ventricles. So the parasympathetics have no way to regulate ventricle, ventricular contractility because they don't go to the ventricles, so they can't do it. Okay. So we have sympathetic control of stroke volume because the sympathetic nerves do get to those muscle cells. Okay. So the way they do that we have norepinephrine, right, coming from those postganglionic cells. We got those beta-1 adrenergic receptors again, right? So those are those same ones that we saw in the SA node. We have cyclic AMP again, because those beta-1 receptors are adrenergic receptors, right? Beta adrenergic receptors activate cyclic AMP. And the effects here that we have in that cardiac muscle are a little different now. So we're not focused on changing the depolarization exactly the same way. Um, here, we're thinking about how can we make this muscle squeeze harder. So we are going to affect an ion. So calcium, we saw, did make a difference for the SA node. So we see calcium here, a bunch in that list. So we will open more calcium channels. The other thing we're doing is we're increasing the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So we can think of these two things together as putting more calcium where in the cell? Physically, what structures in the cell are we trying to get calcium to when we're thinking about a contraction? I'm not looking at this. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. So we're putting the calcium into the cytosol, which means it's going to affect the troponin, which means it's going to take tropomyosin off those uh, binding sites, right? Which basically means that we're making our cross bridge cycle start happening more, right? So we're then also going to increase the myosin ATPase rate. So what, what effect would that have in a muscle? Where do we see the myosin ATP base? Mm -hmm. Yep, so this is also affecting the cross bridge cycle. We're gonna have more cross bridge cycles per minute, right, basically. And then we enhance the rate of calcium ATP ACE activity in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And what this does is this is about ending that contraction quickly as well. Because as we have the sympathetic nerves activated, they're sending action potentials to the heart. So that means they're, they're really doing two things, right? They're both speeding up the heart rate and they're increasing contractility. So we also want those uh, muscle cells to relax relatively quickly too, because we don't want our heart to like get stuck and contracted as we're continuing to try and fire quickly. So we contract quickly and we relax quickly in the ventricles. So that looks something like this. So here we see our old friend, the beta-1 adrenergic receptor accepting norepinephrine or possibly epinephrine, activating our cyclic AMP second messenger system, which opens calcium channels in the membrane opens calcium channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we have a bunch of calcium 
in the cytoplasm, which gets to our axon and the troponin. So our tropomyosin is coming off those myosin binding sites. We're also speeding up that cross break cycling because we're affecting that myosin ATPase. And then we're relaxing quickly as well because we've increased the reuptake into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So really all that we're doing here in the ventricles, right, with our sympathetic activity, we're doing various things to try and affect that cross bridge cycle, affect that physical muscle cell contraction. So we could have a tension curve here too. What we'll see, right, is what we might expect. At rest, we have a certain amount of tension. When we say that the sympathetic activity is affecting the ventricular contractility, what we mean is it's squeezing harder, so we have greater tension, right? So greater tension when we have sympathetic activity increased. Greater tension. Also note, right? So you might also note where these two curves end. So we just went over the, the effects of the sympathetic activity on those contractile cells. So why is this green curve ending sooner? Which of those effects of the, the sympathetic nerves makes this relax quicker? We're thinking about one of the effects on ions. So, which ion are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Calcium. Okay. So, to relax quickly, what are we going to do with calcium? Do we want it in the cytoplasm or not in the cytoplasm? Exactly. So, this is about that reuptake piece. So, this is uh, that final bullet point increasing that reuptake into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Parasympathetic innervation to those contractile cells doesn't, doesn't really have an effect because we don't really have any significant uh, innervation to the ventricles from the parasympathetic parts of the nervous system. So that's simple. We're thinking about effects on stroke volume. We are not thinking about the parasympathetic nervous system. We might be thinking about hormones. So hormones are going to have Pretty similar effects to the effects of the sympathetic nervous system here on the contractility, largely because those beta-1 adrenergic receptors don't care if they're getting epinephrine or norepinephrine. So when we have epinephrine circulating, like this hormone, we are going to increase our stroke volume, we're going to increase the contractility of those ventricles. And we have a couple other hormones that have effects here, so thyroid hormones, Insulin and glucagon do have effects on contractility as well, but we're, we're not really worried about those details because what we're interested in right now for cardiac output is what's happening in an instant, right? Like what happens uh, kind of during the day and these hormones are, are more likely to have sort of longer term effects, right? So it might be a little more complicated. So now we're going to talk about the effects of end diastolic volume. So we're still talking about affecting stroke volume. We want to remember end diastolic volume, the volume of blood in the ventricle at the end of diastole, so the end of the relaxed period. Right? So this is the maximum amount of blood that's coming into the heart. So that's what our end diastolic volume is. Sometimes we also call end diastolic volume preload. Okay. We're calling it end diastolic volume here because we've already talked about it, already talked about how to measure it. But if you hear that term preload, it's really talking about the same thing, just thinking about it as a pressure rather than thinking about it as a measurement of volume. But it's the same kind of concept. Okay. So when we think about our end diastolic volume and its effect on stroke volume, we talk about something called Starling's law. 
And I added of the heart here because we're going to talk about Starling forces in AMP2. So right now, Starling is, is, is just about this heart stuff. But when you move on to AMP2, you want to realize that, that Starling apparently did a bunch of stuff. The Starling's law of the heart says that as we have increased end diastolic volume, right, we have more blood coming into the heart. That means we stretch those muscle fibers, right? So they need to stretch a little bit to accommodate that greater bond. Now, the thing we didn't know about the heart yet is what its optimal size is, what the optimal length of those muscle fibers is. But actually, the optimal length for those muscle fibers, the place they're most effective at contracting, is larger than the typical size of the heart. So um, they are not at their optimal length in our normal kind of resting state. Right? So this means that as we stretch the heart a little bit, as we expand it, this makes our muscle fibers happy, basically, they're going to be able to contract more because they're getting closer to their optimal length. When we are at our optimal length, we have a greater strength of contraction. So we're more able to contract because the sarcomeres are, are more in a sort of arrangement where they can, the actin and myosin can grab each other, slide past each other better. The result of that is that we're going to have increased stroke volume as we contract a bit harder. So when we think about end diastolic volume, as we move into AMP2, we're going to be thinking about the rest of the cardiovascular system. So we're going to start thinking about it a tiny bit here. What we want to realize is that end diastolic volume is sort of inextricably linked to the concept of venous return. So our veins right, venous veins, our veins are bringing back blood to the right atrium, right? So as we have increases in venous return, so more blood coming through those veins to the right atrium, that's how we get the end diastolic volume, right? That blood is coming from the veins. So if we speed up the rate of blood coming back to the heart, that's going to increase our end diastolic volume. So this arrow actually could have some more steps in here, right? So we might say that this arrow also in includes an increase in end diastolic volume. Okay. And what does an increase in end diastolic volume do? What's going on with those muscle fibers when we have more volume? Mm -hmm. Yep. Stretch the muscle closer to optimal length. How you would test that, right? That seems like an evolutionary question, kind of. Well, I just think like, yeah. like at rest, our heart is just kind of like doing what it needs. Mm -hmm. But if it was like doing everything it could at rest and then we got stressed, mm -hmm. we needed it to be more. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to adapt yeah. to that sort of stressful of situation. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I bet there are some people who can't do this that we should look at them. Test it. I'll go on Google Scholar afterwards and see if anybody's done it. <laughs> Uh, stretch to optimal length. Okay. Which means that we increase contractility. Okay. Which I guess is that last point, right? So increased contractility is where that arrow went to, which increases the stroke volume. Okay. So we could draw a curve together. So this is called a starling curve. And what that is, is the relationship between end diastolic volume and the stroke volume. 
All right, so this is telling us, okay, so say we have this amount of blood, this is how much we're gonna pump out, All right? So how much stroke volume are we gonna have given we have this much venous return to the heart, creating this much end diastolic volume, All right? So at any given point in time, you would literally be at a point on this line, right? So this isn't, the x-axis isn't time. You don't go through all of this. Often our x-axis is time. We think about things rising and lowering, but this is so that we can find the stroke volume. So we could kind of look it up using a curve like this. So this does show us how that optimal length idea uh, works. So remember that when we're not at optimal length, right, our sarcomeres might look something like this. And the problem with this is, or the reason we can't contract as much, right, is because we don't have a lot of space anymore, right? Like these can't slide very far fast past each other before they bump into each other. So what happens when we stretch those muscle fibers, we have more space here, right? So we have less overlap. And so when we contract, we have farther to contract, so that's an increase in contractility. So that's what our sarcomeres would look like conceptually in the cardiac muscle fibers at different volumes. So we'll leave off there. I think we just have families of curves to go over next time. And then we'll be done with all our content. We need to do a deep dive and a review. As you're going through your for everyday life, uh, at the end of next week, I will be asking you what exam you would each like to retake just so I can get that set up in Brightspace. Um, so think it over. You don't all have to pick the same one or anything. This isn't like a, a vote. It's just a, a decision so I know what to give you access to.